welcome Jamie Anderson to the Everything Saxophone Podcast. This is going to be so much fun, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for me. <laughs> we're sitting here. We're laughing already. We're just. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell them about your false start. That's right. <laughs> or the spider story. But um, <laughs> anyway, listen, how's it going? I'm so glad that you're here. I'm really good. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's certainly my second ever podcast interview, so I'm still quite nervous, but super stoked to be here. Oh, cool, cool. No, this is this is totally awesome. I know you were on with Bobby Osinski, um Yeah. Yeah, a few months ago and such. So awesome. That's really great. Um, yeah, so, you know, I got to ask before we get into your background and stuff. So your site is called Get Your Sax Together. And I keep thinking, yeah. someone must have said to him at one point, get your sax together. Or how did you come up with the name? <laughs> I know, I know. You, you can ask me where it came from. Uh, I wish I had a really snappy answer for that, actually. But you're actually the first person that's ever asked me that. And now I'm combing my memory banks. And I honestly can't remember. I just, I just think it was one of those things that, you know, it just comes out the blue. Because... It's really hard, isn't it, trying to think of a, a good a good name for your thing? Is it like you know? There's so many like Sax Academy, Online Sax School. Um, you know, that's why mine's my name. <laughs> <'cause I couldn't laughs> think <of> it. <laughs> it's a solid choice, definitely a solid choice. So I can't actually remember, but um, yeah, I think I, I, it just popped in my head, and I thought, yeah, that's great. I love that. Hey, get your sax together. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's not a very good answer, but that's that's all I got on that. Oh, no, it's all but good. I, I'm wondering if it's like a, a UK, you know, across the pond type of saying or something. Like that. Well, you know, we say get your act together a lot, but yeah, that's a, that's, yeah, maybe that's not an across the pond thing, but yeah, get your act together. Come on, man, get your act together. <laughs> so I guess that's where it comes from, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, now listen. So yeah, you've got your, your, if you're watching the video, you're seeing this awesome background. He's got his lights on. All right, Fran, you know what? I'll put my lights on too. I'll have to match yeah, come you. On, do it. Do I got to do it. All right. Oh, there we go. Me up. There we go. We're all, as you, as she said, it, you said it before, we're all pimped out in our background. <laughs> oh dear. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. And of course, the only thing I don't have Barry Saxes for sure. And you've got one in the background over there. So I'm just very jealous about that. Yeah, but it's only a, what is it? I think it's only a Yami 32. So don't get too excited. <laughs> Mind you, I say only Yami 32. They're absolutely fab. Oh, for sure. For sure. All right. Well, and, and we were joking before about gear and all that kind of thing. So we'll get into that later. Although okay, I think yeah. I'm not I'm not a gear head um, myself. And you were joking that you're not either. But we'll, well, we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, talk to us a little bit about um, how did you get started in music? Not necessarily saxophone, because you could have been playing other instruments before saxophone. But how did you get started yeah. in music? Well, I think I played... Um recorder you know like everyone played recorder at school right and they you had that manky bucket with the disinfectant <laughs> so i think i played that <laughs> and my mom is very musical um she played piano and um she was a primary school teacher so she played piano all the time at school and she went to um she went to teacher training college and did music there so she's been, always been a really big keen musician so she played piano a lot you know i've got a really early memory of just kind of she must have been practicing for a grade whatever it was and I used to I must have been quite young right five maybe six and I would just sit on the floor around her legs and I'd be pushing the pedals of the, <laughs> it must have been super triggering in looking back in retrospect so I'd be like pushing the pedals of the piano when she was playing but uh you know looking back with a more philosophical um view I guess that sound was soaking up into me right next to the sounding board of the piano um, my dad played guitar and he used to sing songs. He's he's really bad. He kind of he just sings the next line when he's ready, you know. So <laughs> later on, later on when I heard the originals of all the songs that he used to sing, I was like, "What? You never used to sing it like that." <laughs> Two full bars don't exist. Anything other than open chords don't exist. So if it's an F sharp chord, he just stayed on E or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you know, to cut a long story short, there was music around a lot. Um, and then I then I switched to clarinet. My mum got me a clarinet, which was when I was about nine, I guess, I got a clarinet, so quite young. And then sort of the years sort of ticked over, and then I was in a heavy metal band, believe this. Here's, a, here's an exclusive. So then I played bass and guitar 
uh, at various times in a heavy metal band when I was sort of early teens. And then I guess um, to my to my clarinet teacher's credit, well, let's talk about my first clarinet teacher who used to fall asleep in lessons. And then I went through the first couple of exams and had zero articulation. He didn't tell me that you needed to start each note with your tongue and go, ta. <laughs> so I was literally took two exams on clarinet with no tonguing at all. And then, I, then um, my mum also played viola for her sins. And she used to go to an amateur orchestra. And they had a, this uh, soloist came in and she played the clarinet, uh, Mozart clarinet concerto. And mom got chatting to her and she said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll teach Jamie, yeah. <laughs> and then she was like, well, are you going to tongue anything? I was like, huh? <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> so all my exam, uh, you know, the critique that they write a little bit about each piece. And it all said, lack of articulation, lack of articulation. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I had this uh, uh, this great teacher on clarinet, Hilary Saunders, she was called. And um, she really helped me get everything together. But then to her credit, she realized that uh, I guess I was about 13 or 14. And it wasn't really appealing. The, cl the classical clarinet thing wasn't really appealing to me at that age. And she recommended that I go and see this other jazz teacher he was a guy called Gordon Cruikshanks, who's, who's now passed away, unfortunately. He's uh, a well-known jazz broadcaster in Scotland, which is where I grew up. Um, and he was a jazz player and a complete wreckhead. His, his personal life was in disarray. So he lived in Edinburgh, and my mum used to drive me about, I guess it was 45 minutes or an hour maybe, which is quite a lot in the UK. Nothing for you guys. You just go and post a letter. You'll drive for an hour. Oh, it depends on but, where you are. I'm originally from Long Island, and, and like 45 minutes, we don't do it. But out here, it's like, oh, 45 minutes, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I've heard people say, oh, it's only like six hours away. I'm like, what? <laughs> I know, I don't get it either. <laughs> You've got a big country. <laughs> anyway, we'd get, to, we'd get to his flat in, uh, in Edinburgh, which was just a sort of, he'd got divorced and his personal life was a wreck. But there were, because he worked for a radio station, BBC Radio Scotland, he had all these LPs everywhere, just piled up randomly. So he would just like give me an LP or a, or a CD that he'd been sent, um, Hank Mobley or Junior Walker and the All Stars and whatever. So I'd I'd hear a lot of music that way, and he'd and um, we'd get into this tiny. It was like a closet. It was like a tiny cupboard. Uh, it must have been only a couple of feet across. And he'd close the door, and then he'd spark up and start smoking in this tiny, <laughs> literally like a booth, a sealed booth with no ventilation. He'd start sparking up. And then he'd take his cigarette and there's ash going everywhere and he'd stick the cigarette in the E-flat guard of his sax and then play for a bit. <laughs> sometimes, he, <laughs> sometimes he would just still be holding the fag in his right hand as he was playing. So that was hilarious. But he had pictures of train and, and, and miles and bird everywhere. And then sometimes he'd just be chronically depressed and he'd sit there with his hand in his hands going, oh man, I'll be... This teenage kid thinking, what is going on? And meanwhile, your <laughs> lungs are being destroyed. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. And then sometimes he wouldn't even be there. We'd turn up and then he just wouldn't even be there. No shows. However, wow. he did kind of inspire me, you know, in a very happy way. To smoke? Way. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, did. he did inspire me to get into jazz and uh, the sort of romance of jazz, you know, the, the stories and the characters and... And I fell in love with that, and I, I went to the, I joined the Fife Youth Jazz Orchestra with this really well-known educator called uh, Richard Michael, who was one of my really great early mentors. And I guess, um, you know, the heavy metal thing for me, I didn't, you know, I was just a middle-class kid. I wasn't really a rebellious rocker. Uh, so that, you know, that was a bit too hardcore. I didn't have long hair or anything like that. In fact, I had National Health Service glasses, which is really quite sad. <laughs> um, so that was kind of too rebellious, but then classical was like too boring. So in my mind, I was thinking, oh, jazz is great. You know, there's there's loads of amazing characters. There's, you know, there's uh, lots of drug addicts. The, the music feels interesting to me. So I think that's why I, was, I gravitated towards it and, and uh, fell in love with it. The drug addicts, you mean? A <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a long answer. Did that answer your question or is that the next five questions? No, 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 that was really good. And you know, the funny thing, when you mentioned clarinet and then you mentioned heavy metal band, I'm like, did he, did he try to play clarinet in a heavy metal band? <laughs> I should have said. 
<laughs> I didn't play clarinet in the heavy metal band. However, I did write some songs, and um, it, I I couldn't tell you the date, but we'll we'll probably all remember it. There was a plane crash in uh, Lockerbie in Scotland, where this jumbo jet was like blasted out of the sky in a terrorist attack. So that was quite, you know, that wasn't next to me in Scotland, but it was in the same country, not too far away. So that was the first sort of piece of music I wrote, this heavy metal song about that <laughs> that Lockerbie thing. But years later, I found the chart that I made, and it was pretty good. You know, I was writing out all the notes with the right rhythms, and I must have been, you know, 12 or 13, I guess. Um, so even back then, I was into charts. <laughs> well, and cool. You should actually take that chart out again and and try to you know jazz it up, so to speak, and you know put it either a swing beat on it or a funk beat or something like that. <laughs> it's just low E eighth <laughs> notes, so that's all it does. Dunk, dunk, oh, dunk, dunk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect the clarinet, mind you. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. Good register of the clarinet for sure. So so then all right. So then um you know clarinet. When did you switch over or when did you go to saxophone? Uh, I reckon I was about 13, 13, yeah, is when I made the switch. And then my mum bought me a new sax. I, I, I want to say it was a Jupiter or something, but I thought it was so cool. Because I was quite young when I played clarinet. In fact, I used to run around like holding the clarinet like a gun and going... <laughs> <laughs> That's how we play clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't do that with sax. But yeah, I thought I, th I thought the sax was super cool. Was it an uh, alto? Yeah, alto, yeah. I don't think anybody else thought sax was super cool. In fact, <laughs> in fact, there's this super embarrassing story where I, I, I tried to ask this girl out of school. My family remorselessly teased me for this one. And, um, you know, and I'd said, I think it was practically the first girl that ever asked that. I said, oh, will you go out with me? <laughs> and she said, no. And I said, but I play saxophone. <laughs> And then she said, definitely not. <laughs> she, she said, I can't remember what she said, probably something along the lines of, so. I was like, I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe that this, you know, this cached meant nothing. <laughs> and that basic, that story basically continued for the rest of my life. So <laughs> all the legions of people that come up to you and say, oh, saxophone's so sexy, blah, blah. I was like, well, not in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was that. That's awesome. So, all right. So after high school, you know, um, did you say, you know, when did you decide you wanted to become a musician? Yeah, great question. And I can give a super clear answer to that for, for once, because there was this real defining moment when I went on the uh, a jazz summer school, which was hosted by Richard Michael, who I mentioned. It was the five uh, jazz summer school. I think it was a couple of weeks back then. And it was residential, and so I went along to that, and um, there were loads of fantastic tutors there who were like London conservatoire teachers. Um, and I had such an amazing, fantastic time. I think Tim Garland might have been, if you, you know who Tim Garland is? Yeah, sax I, yeah, I interviewed him for the podcast. Oh, there you go, fab. I think he was teaching on that first course. And I was super inspired, learned all about the modes, and <laughs> I came home. Uh, let me think how old I would have been. I was just about to take my kind of final options at, at school. In Scotland, you call it hires. In England, you call it A-levels. I don't know what you call it in the States, but um, it would have been about 15, I reckon. So I came home from this uh, from this course, and I wasn't even going to do music at, at school at that point. And I said, I want to be a musician. That's that. <laughs> my mum was like, yes. And my dad was like, oh, no. <laughs> 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 so yeah we got in touch with the school and said oh you know jamie wants to do music and the kind of standard stuffy sort of head of music was like well you, you haven't done music so far so you can't suddenly start uh but he let us in eventually and uh i kind of instantly had to prove myself i had to <laughs> start it went from zero to harmonizing bar chorales so i was like really thrown in the deep end and i never read bass clef before so it was a real like sink or swim vibe um, but it all panned out in the end yeah so that was that was the moment it was just uh you know one of those uh come to jesus moments i was like boom that's it i know what i want to do and i've never considered doing anything else all these decades i've never been um 
I've never had any doubt about what I want to do, which is quite quite a lovely thing to have in your life because so many other people I talk to, uh, and I'm sure you you must have had this as well. People say, oh, you're so lucky, you know, doing what you love. Whereas, of course, everybody can do what they love, really. There are literally people whose job it is to test golf courses. You know, there's, if you really go for it, you can do anything you, you want. Uh, for some reason, I just I just did it. And um, I'm, I'm glad I did, yeah. So that was the moment. That was my big moment. I think it's just the, what you just said. You just did it. You know, you just went for it. And I, I remember um, uh, with the Bobby Osins Osinski um, podcast, you had other sink or swim moments too. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what they are, though, because I can't remember that interview. Give us a clue. Yeah, where you were, um, you know, like where in your region, like you were like, you know, big fish in a little pond. And then when you went to other situations, you know, you were, um, you know, amongst all the others and you had to prove yourself again. I think it was like these these orca these uh, jazz orchestras and stuff. Right. I think that's I think that's true. I don't know when that's when that ever stops. I don't know if you've experienced this as well. But yeah, when I first of all, I was in the Fife Youth Jazz Orchestra, the local thing and then I was top of the tree there. And I was like, "Yeah, I'm the I'm the man." <laughs> and then you go to like the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, which I joined, uh, which is run by Bill Ashton. And suddenly I was like, "I am definitely not the man <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not even the minnow." So you're immediately thrown into more challenging situations when you go to a big, you know. I guess it's like going from provincial, whatever. Kansas to New York City and boom suddenly there's all the greatest people from every little town come there and they're you know suddenly down the bottom of the tree again which is what happened to me and then even you know later in your career when I started doing uh, West End stand it well we call it depping I think you guys call it subbing when I started depping in West End shows that was the same thing again I was had to up my level uh, you know, to take it to, to just to do what was required really for the gig. Um, and I'm kind of enjoying not doing that <laughs> since lockdown, to be honest, because uh, I can just chill out for a while. It's really exciting when you have to really raise your game and, and, and nail something under really high pressure, but it does, it does take it out of you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So what you're saying right now, I was going to ask you, you know, what, tips or strategies you have for those types of situations, you know, those types of sink or swim situations, what were you thinking mentally, you know, your approach or, or whatever, if you can remember. Right. Yeah. Good question. Um, well, the big answer is that most of the preparation happens beforehand, right? So if you can, if you can do all the work before, it certainly takes the pressure off a bit more in the moment. Because what many, well, well, I guess I was going to say what many people don't understand, but actually thinking about it, what most people who play saxophone or any other instrument who have done any kind of performance will relate to, is that you can't account for that situation, how different it is from the practice room, right? Yeah. So <laughs> you you can nail it in the practice room, but then there's untold other factors suddenly bombarding you so you know when you go to do a, a gig in a pit or something it's completely different sound the headphones sound sound completely different you can't hear all the instruments that you're hearing before when you're practicing it might be hotter colder it might be um dark you can't see anything you can't see your instruments that you could easily pick up before um there's a tiny little screen with a conductor on it whereas you could see it massive on your computer before and now it's just this kind of six inch little thing, little screen. Um, the performance might be completely different from what you're used to. Your instruments might respond completely differently in the different temperatures. All these variables and, of course, nerves and all that stuff. So when you get in there, you've really, I always say to the people I teach, because people describe it all the time when I'm teaching them, they say, oh, I could do that, you know, when I was practicing and I've come to the lesson and I can't. And I say, that's because I, I don't I don't judge you on it. I've already deducted 
thirty percent of your talent, which I can easily add on because I know most people are about thirty percent better than they appear in lessons if they get nervous. But that really means that if you want to nail something, you've got to be 130% good at it. So that when all those other variables are like strimmed off, that you can still nail it. So my my hot tip for trying to rise to the occasion would be make sure you're much better than you need to be, not just good enough. Because if you're hanging on by your fingernails, lots of other things can go wrong. And derail you, the, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Can but on the other hand, it can sometimes work in your favor. So when you're in the gig, especially if it's more of a, like a jazz gig, I guess, there's, you know, you can raise your level and play a lot better. So it can definitely help you or it can hinder you depending how you harness, harness that energy. But definitely, you know, staying calm and, you know, breathing and, just staying in the moment of where you are in the music, not thinking about what you might have gone wrong, done wrong, not thinking about what might be coming up that might be difficult because then you're much more likely to screw up the thing you're actually doing in that moment. So I try and just stay right in the moment, calm enough, but, you know, focused, calm, calm focus, whatever that looks like. Yeah, but you know, what's interesting, and you're talking about staying in the moment. And I think for a lot of people, that's really, really challenging, you know, because it, there's so many, and, and you know, here's why I'm going to say this too. We're conditioned, let me grab this. We're conditioned to be distracted with these phones, right? We, you know, right. we have the attention span that's less than a goldfish, which is, you know, really bad. Um, <laughs> but, you know, especially nowadays where everything's a distraction and, um, I think it's really a challenge for people to stay in the moment, you know, while these things are going on. And, and you know, the phone is, is a bad enough distraction as it is, but, you know, yeah, when you're in the pit or when you're on a stage um, or, you're, or you're in a smoky closet with your teacher, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it is, it is hard to stay in that moment, moment and not get derailed, not only by outside forces, but also by your own thoughts too, you know? Sure. Yeah. And... There's one thing which there's no shortcut to. That was a good sentence, wasn't it? If there, <laughs> There's one thing that you can't practice, and that's experience. So the more you do it, the more experience you get, and the more you can override that crippling sort of feeling, you know, when you, you get all prickly and hot and your brain starts going and you, you can't breathe, and I'm sure we've... Well, I'm sure many of us have had that feeling on gigs where it's just horrible. <laughs> the real panic. I used to get it when I used to, um, when I first joined the Fife Youth Jazz Orchestra and suddenly the whole band would be like blowing away. And I'd be like, well, what? what's going on? There's no music. But everyone was just like jamming a blues head or something. That was my first shock. I was like, hang on, this, what were you all playing? What notes are you all playing? There's no music. Wow. And then... <clears throat> And then when you get pointed out to stand up in this kind of rabbit in the headlights moment and uh, your mouth goes dry and you've, you've, you're chest breathing and you're all prickly and your legs are, you know, all wobbly. It's a, quite a horrible feeling. Um, but the more you do it, um, the more you do it, the less it happens. But sometimes I think it'll just never stop because every time I do a gig, I'm still thinking, ugh. What you? Why did you do that? That was, that was terrible. Why did you? You should have just played that instead. Did you know? So I don't think it ever ends. Does it ever end? You tell me, Donna. No, and, and you know, listen. What you just said, I think, was incredibly value, valuable because a lot of people will, you know, will say, "Oh my gosh," you know, someone of Jamie's caliber, right, is saying that you know he's on a gig and he's not like totally happy with what he played. It, I, I hate to say it this way, but it gives some people hope because they think that, you know, um, people that are, you know, professional level and stuff like that, that they don't make mistakes. Of course we do. We know how to hide them. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just get really good at masking your mistakes, don't you? Yeah. Oh, my God, that for sure. But, you that know, the other, th the other thing, too, though, you mentioned, um, you know, even doing gigs now or especially, okay, especially after lockdown, especially after things closing down, because everything's, uh, you know, I, I've been playing, I was able to play a lot of private gigs during lockdown. And um, now some of the band gigs are coming back. But 
it's the cobwebs, you know, it's like shaking off the cobwebs after not being with a group live for what, almost two years. Um, still get the nerves. But what I always say to people is I get nervous when I don't have the nerves. I know that sounds bizarre, but I get nervous when I don't have the nerves because then that means that I'm not a hundred percent there. You know what I mean? And, and the nerves are going to help give you that extra boost of energy and adrenaline so that you will do well. If the thing is, the trick is, like you said, having enough experience so that you can harness the nerves to your advantage as opposed to letting them overcome you. Right. So I think sometimes I've got this other trick as well. I mean, nobody knows the mind of a fly, but it does seem that, you know, a fly perceives uh, the world slower, right, than us, which is why it's hard to swat a fly because they can kind of see the newspaper coming and just casually fly away before you can hit them. So I try and I try and harness this kind of effect. If I'm playing a fast passage, I try and almost like freeze time in my head. So the fast thing's coming up. Instead of kind of seeing all those notes and going, ah, blah, 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 I just kind of see if I can go slow mo in my perception. Did it and did it do 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 even if it's going So I kind of experience it in slow mo. If that makes any sense, it's like when people are in um, a car crash and everyone reports, um, you know, time just went super slow mo in that moment in a time of extreme, you know, make or break stress. So if there was a way of somehow utilizing that in music so you could be like the fly and it was just easy to play these notes really as, as slowly as you want, despite them flying by. That would really be something. Now, I can't do that, but I try and get on that spectrum, let's say. Yeah, you know, um, I forgot the name of that term um, uh, where, I, I hate to say it this way, but if something like bad happens or whatever, it feels like time is slowing down. Um, oh, gosh, um, I forgot the name of it. The, there is a term for that. And I remember for myself the one, one time I was I was mugged, and I'll never forget this. So I'm walking... Um, I don't think I've ever shared this live, but I've, I was, um, I was actually director or, or social worker in a senior center. Yes, I, I actually have a social work degree and I was, I was actually advocating for senior center, senior citizen rights, right. And senior citizen safety. And I'm walking back from the subway and, you know, we were not in the best area. And so, you know, it was raining of course. And, um, I had my, my pocketbook across my my shoulder, that kind of thing, you know, following all the rules, whatever. And I noticed someone walking towards me. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna cross the street. Oh, they crossed the street too. I'm like, great, okay. And then they start to pass me and I thought, okay, nothing's going on. And then they yanked my bag off of me and then they started to run. But I never forget when they yanked the bag, it's like time started to slow down as I was watching this person grabbing my stuff, you know? And, um, you know, it's interesting because if you think about the martial art of Tai Chi, Tai Chi is a very potent martial art. People don't realize it. They think, oh, these senior citizens, they're just doing this, this thing just to keep them active. No, Tai Chi is a very potent martial art. And when it's practiced slowly, but if, uh, God forbid, if one of those people got into an, a fight and they were versed enough in Tai Chi, they could defend themselves because you can when you practice something slow bob reynolds talks about this a lot too but when you practice something slow you can speed it up mm. yeah well first of all i'm sorry you had that experience um but yeah it's it's common to to um everyone in a sort of traumatic situation isn't it same thing happened to my wife when she crashed her car when she was young just she could just see the car spinning you know <laughs> yeah wow it's, it is crazy so, yeah, if there was a way of positively harnessing that, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? I think, can, yeah, I think it's, you know, you play the flight of the bumblebee, bumblebee like, like it was nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, no, that's true. Actually, when you say fly the bumblebee, I always think of, uh, well, Raphael, I'm also a trumpet player too. So Raphael Mendez's version and also Wint Wh Marsalis's version too, as well. I, that just like pops up into my head, but no, for sure. And I think, I think the thing is that, you know, what you're saying is um, that focused calm, you know, that's really the key. And the way to get there from what you're saying is, you know, just kind of like slowing things down, you know, slowing your mind down. 
Right. And there's a lot of there's a lot of professional blagging which can go a long way, right? So I think uh, one of the big difference between enthusiasts and professionals is just keeping keeping the momentum of the line going and kind of skimming over the bits you can't quite nail, but hitting the highs and the lows, keeping the contour, not playing in the rests, particularly if you've got a really hard solly, sack solly that you have to sight read or something. You know, look for the, <laughs> look for those accents. Don't play in the gaps. And even if you can't go, you know, but 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 you can go, but but you know, you can hit the odd note, hit the contours, and sound like you're in the section without sticking out. Whereas somebody who's an enthusiast might just kind of bumble into it, you know, go. So I think we kind of learn how to just not stick out, even if you can't quite nail it. And that goes a long way. I shouldn't be saying that, should I? I should be saying, oh, yeah, I, I totally nail everything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? It's it's being realistic, it's being practical. And the thing is that it's not like you didn't put the work in to learn your craft. It's just that sometimes, like, you may be, um, as we call it, subbing, and you call it, what is it, ta- dap, dapping? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> dapping. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it's, it's... D- dapping. So if you're a dapping, deputy, okay. you're dapping, yeah. Okay, all righty. So if you're subbing and you've got this crazy, you know, passage or something, and um, and I know, like in my situation, I was subbing one gig, and they didn't have, uh, so I was playing tenor, they didn't have the tenor book that I needed, like the guy I was subbing for was late. And so he didn't have the book. And it was a big band thing. And so I'm looking off of the first alto sax part, trying to um, trying to transpose, and it's dark. And the guy doesn't have a light on his book. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, <laughs> you really are kidding, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just, my experience, I just saw whatever I could and I just, you know, did whatever I could. But wow, it's it's experience. You know, it really is experience. And it's just, it's just having the, um, well, it's like the Nike slogan, just do it. You just have to do it. And you just have yeah. to, you know, um, uh, let me ask you this question. This will lead to this next thing too. Dealing with um, with negativity or criticism or stuff like that. Like I'm saying, just do it. But there's a big fear that we all have. You know that we're going to get criticized, that we're going to get laughed at, or whatever. How you've been in so many different types of playing situations. You know how have you dealt with that? If if that's ever even been a problem. Uh, when I first joined the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, there was definitely you know, a lot of sink or swim. Um, And when I started depping around doing West End shows, there was the kind of, well, I say unspoken, (laughs) it's barely unspoken, you know, just disdainful looks if you you mess something up. So that's, there would be the two situations which I've experienced it, Um, (laughs) actually. There was there was this one gig. This is a this is a classic story, but I'll try and keep it fairly short. To cut a long story short, we were we were booked to play um to play on this cross channel ferry, you know, to going from the UK to it might have been Holland across the North Sea. And it's a really it's a really rough gig. So the guy, the band leader, had created all these TV theme tunes, um, famous TV themes. They were all they were all great. And he'd put loads of effort in. And then we were also in fancy dress. So we were playing, you know, the Batman theme, um, some of the well-known uh, UK TV shows. Um, I can't remember what else we played. Lots of, you know, might have been Cagney and Lacey, whatever. Loads of famous TV shows. And we're all in fancy dress. And then <laughs> this <laughs> this crowd <laughs> was completely raucous and hated everything we were doing. Um, in fact, at one point, we, we played Stuck in the Middle of You uh, and... I went, there were no horns in it, so me and the trumpet player went out into the middle of the dance floor and I had an L.A. policeman's uniform on and he had an ear which was carved out of ham and then he cut the ear off with theatrical blood. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the scene from the, move, from, um, from the movie. Anyway, eventually somebody just ran up to the front. They said, Oi, can you don't play some madness? This is rubbish. <laughs> I should say they're not the exact words he used, but um, <laughs> yeah. So that was some pretty direct criticism. 
this is rubbish. Play some madness. <laughs> <laughs> we all thought you haven't got this. You haven't got this concept, have you? I'm in a Batman outfit. Can't you see where anyway? So yeah, that <laughs> kind of direct criticism aside, I don't know. Um, it is pretty horrible, actually. You know, on a sort of serious note, it's pretty stressful and it's pretty horrible and it's not something that I enjoy because music's supposed to be fun. And, you know, the whole point of it is we're not saving lives. In fact, I know loads of paramedics and they have a laugh as well. So if they can have a laugh saving lives, truly, we can have a laugh playing music, for goodness sake, you know. Especially when you are when you go and see a West End show from the audience and uh, what, especially a show that you've already played. And that bit that you were stressing about all this time is just almost inaudible and buried in the mix. And it's like a theatre mix and you can hardly hear the band anyway. And you suddenly think, all that stress and nobody in the audience could even hear it anyway. And it's all just the MD or the person sitting next to you that's stressed about it. And you think, oh, get a life, you lot. Um, so I don't like it, but it does exist. Um, and conversationally, you've told me that you've had a bit more grief than me, I think. So I think I've I've been quite lucky, all in all. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> I think it's also how you how you perceive it, you know, um, it, um, and I guess also how you deal with it too, you know, because it, it, you'll, you can't please everybody, you know, that's the bottom line. And um, some people will love what you do, some people will hate what you do. And if you think back to some of the, you know, the jazz masters that, you know, now we revere, well, back then, they did, not everybody revered, you know, uh, what Charlie Parker did right away or what John Coltrane did right away or what Ornette Coleman did right away, you know? Um, so it, it's it's those types of, of, of things, I guess, to think about as well, for sure. Yeah, I guess you just have to be confident in in what you're doing. I mean, if we're talking about, you know, like a jazz creative choice, that's one thing. If you're just talking about people criticizing your, you know, your performance on a in a more commercial setting, I guess that's another. But, I mean, one thing that's guaranteed to, you know, some people don't take things very personally, but there's there's one area of performance which people seem to be super touchy about and take personally. Do you, what do you think it is, if you had to guess one? I'm actually... Um, what do you think people are most spiky about? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're alluding to. For me, I think it's intonation. I think interesting. Maybe that's you know maybe that doesn't happen in the states. Maybe people are just like, "Hey, buddy, you're sharp. Sort it out." Uh. <laughs> but in the UK, we're like, "My God, you may as well criticize somebody's mother rather than say they're out of tune." You know? Wow. Okay. Maybe it is. I mean, it it is a big deal. You know, here for sure. But um, but you know what? I I think okay. I think back to, you know, there's, again, there's been some jazz masters. Um, oh, gosh. Now the name escapes me. Jackie um, McLean? Yes. Who always played high. Who always played sharp. You better play, you better play sharp than out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> Every sax player's favorite expression. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, though. Um I, I, again, I, I play trumpet as well, and I think um, we're, uh, we're, you know, when it comes to brass instruments too, I think, you know, intonation, it, it depends on what the genre that you're playing. If it's classical music, you, you have to be dead on. You have to be dead on. Not to say that you can't be dead on for jazz. You, you, you need to have good intonation for sure, but when you're in the act of creating and stuff like that, you know, your mind is in a, in a different spot. Yes, you've worked all these years and you know, with your tone and all this other kind of thing. But there's going to be times when, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be a little bit out of tune or whatever, you know, and, and saxophones are inherently, you know, out of tune for some, some notes. I mean, you know, especially the older model of saxophones, the newer ones are so much better intonation wise. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think it's, it's also the genre of music where that, you know, that really matters. Um, I was thinking, you know, when you were saying like, what's one thing that people, you know, really go nuts on? I mean, at, at first I was thinking, um, well, I'll, I'll just say it this way, you know, a lot of people are just very visual. So, you know, 
Um, they're thinking about how the person looks on stage, all that kind of right. stuff. Um, I think those those are some elements that, you know, they're so minor, you know, but people get turned off by that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, I just don't know what it is about. I don't know what the problem is with the tuning. Uh, somebody could say, hey, uh, you're playing the wrong note there, or, um, oh, I think you might just be rushing, and that's no problem. But then people will sit next to each other, do eight shows a week for five years in a pit, and don't feel able to say, do you know what, I think you're probably playing that note a bit sharp, and every night I'm playing it sharp as well to match you, but... <laughs> Oh, I don't know interesting. what the problem is, but it is definitely a thing. Yeah. So. But you know what's interesting too, though, now that you mentioned that, I think time, people call it timing, um, but it's, it's uh, steadiness of rhythms would be the, you know, the, the snooty term for this. But I think, you know, when people don't, when their timing is off, I think that is a really big deal um, here. That's what I think I hear more people talking about for sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is a big deal though, isn't it? It feels horrible. Yeah. That's the right word. It feels horrible because rhythm yeah. is a feel, you know, groove yeah. is a feel for sure. Yeah. That's interesting. It is. Yeah. Especially if I'm sure there's loads of other cultural differences, cultural taboos with performance across different, different places. Fascinating. Yeah. Because when you think about it, you know, um, Western music, um, the grooves are not as complicated in any stretch of the imagination compared to African rhythms, West African rhythms, C Cuban rhythms and stuff. And that's where, you know, uh, Latin rhythms where you have to be dead on with with your groove, with with your timing and everything um, where, you know, we didn't have at least I know for me and a lot of people I know, actually, where you you weren't you didn't grow up listening to all types of cultural music. And being nah. exposed to different types of, you know, meter signatures and 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 um, subdivisions and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think you're right. You know, culturally, there's going to probably be different things that people are really focused on and really listening to. Yeah, I grew up in John Denver. <laughs> my dad used to play John Denver, and my mom used to play classical. So yeah, no uh, no cultural diversity in my um, musical formative years. <laughs> that's too funny. That's too funny. Well, well, listen, so we, we've, we've talked about like growing up and stuff like that. Let me ask you one thing. And, and even if it came from the smoky closet, um, what was, was there anything from your early teachers, any kind of, you know, concept you learned or exercise you learned that really stood out for you and that you still, you know, it, it helped you musically, it helped shape you or whatever. Was there anything there? Yeah. Um, let's have a think. I mean, several things have, have influenced me like that. I used to have this, I used to have this chart when I was practicing in my bedroom in Scotland. I used to have this little diagram that I drew on a sheet of paper and it was just, <laughs> looking back, it's a kind of a weird diagram. I guess it was my lungs and then kind of coming up and then my throat and then my mouth and then the saxophone and then all these lines going like spreading out, radiating radiating out in every direction so i always used to practice my sound with that concept of really you know throwing it out and getting every particle of air around you vibrating especially when you think you know you're not the saxophone's not really the instrument as such your entire body is vibrating the instrument of course is vibrating but the air you're really it's exciting all the air in the room, which is then exciting the walls of the room and the air beyond that, because obviously you can hear music beyond the wall. Um, so you kind of, if you see the whole room and if you take that then to a concert hall and you see the entire concert hall or stadium or festival or field even, you know, as your instrument and you're trying to get all that air going you know, it takes it, I think one of the things that people, one of the problems I've seen in some of the people I teach is they've got no vision for their sound. And I think it's partly psychological. They don't see their sound going much further than their teeth or at least the bell of the instrument. And I think maybe they're a bit, um, you know, maybe they're just a bit shy and don't really want to project that sound out because they think it might be rubbish. 
but it's a self-defeating concept. So I always try and teach people you need to just, you need to throw it out there. Get every little bit of air vibrating in the whole room like this. So really you're creating this new giant instrument in every space that you play. And if you're playing in Albert Hall, well, that's an even bigger instrument than playing in Ronnie Scott's, you know. But it's up to you to stand there and really, you know, throw your throw your tone out there with a lot of intention. Now, who taught me that? That's another question. I can't, I can't remember. I was really into Liebman's teaching and, you know, went to his workshops. He came to our music school and I, think I even hung out with him for a, a couple of days. But so that's quite possible. Um, yeah, so that was a really useful concept that I took forward. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. What about you? Well, actually, I was just about to say that was that was really incredible. And I could see that coming from I could see that coming from Dave Liebman. I could definitely see that coming from him. Um, yeah, for me, you know, it's funny <clears throat> when you first started talking about that. Um, it reminds me when I was taking lessons with Vince Panzarella trumpet. And he would talk to me about how the sound doesn't start from the mouthpiece. Think of the sound starting from the bell and going out. So this way you're not stuck. You know, you're not stopping the sound at the instrument. You're starting the sound from the bell onward, so you're blowing through it. And that's what I was thinking about when you were just saying what, what you just did. Ah, nice. Like it. Yeah. I mean, nobody takes a big enough breath either, do they? The, the people who are, you know, sort, no. of, sort of uh, novices and intermediates. That's the first thing that people are shocked about. If I teach them, and actually, here's an interesting thing. I've just started teaching again face to face now that the COVID thing is going down um, for, for the moment at the time of writing. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yes. And um, so there's a few people that I started teaching online, and then this was the first time that we'd seen each other face to face. And then I play, and they're like, whoa, <laughs> that is so loud. And I said, yeah, because you're just listening through a little pair of speakers, you know, you turn it down to the volume you want. But this is the real thing. This is, you know, what I want you to do. I want you to blow almost as hard as you possibly can and try and just blow that instrument apart. That's not to say that I always want you to play triple forte, but I want people to move the bar way higher with their top end of, you know, blowing force. Way higher, like five times more. And then people do it, and it's like a leap of faith. And then once they do it, and they say, oh, that's, I say, yeah, that's it. That's, that's how you blow. And they're like, I can't believe it. I can't believe you blow that hard. I'm like, well, yeah, you got to. <laughs> yeah, you know what this reminds me of? Um, I don't know if you know of Tim Price, but Tim Price, was a, he's a phenomenal player. He's played with Aretha Franklin. He's played with everybody. He's a great teacher, too. And... Um, I've interviewed him for the podcast. We've every time there's been Nam, we always meet up and stuff like that. And oh my gosh! So I remember being at a Nam jam, and all the saxophones on stage and all that kind of thing, right? And Tim Price doesn't need a microphone. All these like 15 saxophones on stage with a full rhythm section. He doesn't even need a microphone to cut through everybody, and you could hear him in the back of the room. I mean, right. he's he's a guy with a huge, beautiful sound. And as soon as you're saying this, I'm thinking Tim Price. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I don't usually get a chance to, you know, stretch the legs of my sound. On jazz gigs, yeah, sure. When you're, like, really going for it and you can blow. But in most situations, I'm, I, like, in a the average big band sax section, you know, I'd be, I'd be way too loud. So I have to kind of notch it all down to blend. Um, but... I think if you if you can create that top end huge sound when all the uh, overtones start to kind of interact and multiply with each other and, and the reed is hitting the tip of the mouthpiece and bouncing back all weird and um, there's that great book which I studied uh, in uh, it's that red book it's all the science of the saxophone it's crazy looking look, uh, saxophone inside out saxophone saxophone from the inside out something like that. I'll put a, put a link in the show notes. I'll send you the link. And he talks about how the you know the reed is vibrating, and then as you blow harder and harder, 
it starts to kind of almost bend up towards the tip of the mouthpiece as it's vibrating, and then it'll be striking the tip of the mouthpiece. And if you're really soft enough, you blow hard enough, uh, you know, it'll just stick there. The, the air pressure will just clamp it shut. And I'm sure you might have had that experience with a super soft reed or when you were starting out or when you play a student's sax and you go, oh, <laughs> let me try this. <laughs> Absolutely nothing happens. <laughs> And your head <laughs> you shut it. But when that reed starts, you know, um, the amplitude is big enough that it starts striking the top of the mouthpiece. Lots of asynchronous vibration starts to happen and you get a whole new range of um, overtones appearing in the in the spectrum of the sound, which gives this kind of sheen and, and depth and, and sparkle to your sound that you just don't get when your reed is not vibrating close to the tip of the mouthpiece. So tonally speaking, there's some benefit to making sure that your read is kind of not at threshold but you know getting there getting close to the threshold of its possibilities to really find to wring out every ounce of tone out of your instrument so if you're only just tickling your read you know there's i guess the argument is if you're only tickling your read, you get a much softer read so that it is vibrating more at least right but not too way. soft where it's going to clamp up right but, you know, my answer is blow harder on the same read. But thinking about it logically, that might be that might be a shout. Yeah, you know what's interesting uh, and what comes to mind um, as we're speaking, I'm wondering if you're, you're more of a visual learner because all these, you're giving me all these great like visual descriptions of things. You drew a diagram when you were very young, you know, the lungs and, and, and like the, the sound coming out, you know, very visual. I'm wondering if you're a visual learner. That's a good question. Um, but you know, if I listen to something, it goes straight in as well. So I can, uh, if I'm trying to, have, um, if I'm trying to learn something, and you know, we've talked about this, we've both got businesses, we've both been associated with this teacher, Jeff Walker. So if I've got his course in my headphones about business and all that stuff, I'll go and walk the dog, but that's going to go straight into my memory banks as well. So it's not that I have to see it on the whiteboard or read a book. Um, so I don't know about, I did read somewhere that um, learning styles like visual and, uh, you know, audio. Kinesthetic and, and auditory, kinesthetic. yeah. I did read somewhere that that has been debunked, but I'm sure I'll just be shot down in flames for that because I don't have the scientific facts. But somebody did say they did a test of all these different things and it wasn't quite as... Um, I know it's taboo to say so because everyone's now firmly in like camp, you know, you're that kind of learner. But um, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's just more if you're interested in the topic that you learn faster. I think, because you know, yeah, I think when it, I don't think it's and, I, and let me say it this way, too. Like you I should say it this way. You're great at giving a visual description. That's a better right. way of me saying it. So, you know, when it comes to learning, some people are more kinesthetic they 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 need to feel it they need to do it some people are auditory you know um and you know are not visual learners they do say adults do become you know as we get older we're more visual learners and that kind of thing um i do think it's a mix of course but um i think for you you give these great visual descriptions here i'm like this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> okay whatever works i'll yeah I mean, I think if you're, um, we've both got courses and the challenge is always trying to keep everybody engaged, right? There's people who need to know every detail and there's people who don't need to know any details. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. So when I design my courses, I try and, obviously I'm talking, I'm telling it. There's, I try and have words up on the screen and pictures, you know, to complement it, to try and, try and keep everybody happy if you know what I mean but I think maybe one of the biggest uh determiners of if you're going to learn something is if you're interested in me. my son Sonny who's 13 he'll not learn a single thing but at school or whatever but then if he, he if he's into something suddenly he's an expert instantly I'm like huh so <laughs> yeah. you can learn that instantly but you're not as the slightest bit interested in the things that you're not learning so I don't know yeah, but you know what's interesting also for us as course makers as well, um, it, it's not only um, presenting the material in, in different ways, but you know, the biggest challenge, and we've spoken about this before, 
is people that are coming to us don't have the backgrounds that we do in terms of being taught in school. You know, they go to YouTube University and, you know, where it's hunt and peck and you don't know what you don't know. And that I know for me is a huge, huge challenge to address that because everybody has a different experience when it comes to that. Right. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? It's the, the greatest gift and the greatest challenge, isn't it, YouTube? Predominantly the greatest gift, I would say, because when I was learning sax, you know, at 13, I would have absolutely killed for YouTube. If I could have me, you know, if I could do the DeLorean thing and have me teaching me cool stuff when I was 13, I would just be like, God, this is the greatest. What, somebody's teaching me how to do it? Because I couldn't find it anywhere. You had to get a book. Um, you know, it was sheet music or nothing, wasn't it? Or work it out for yourself. Yeah, or or you have the the and I had I had a trumpet teacher who sometimes wouldn't show up or was drunk half the time, or you have the drunk teacher coming to you. <laughs> in fact, I remember there's a there's a well known uh, Scottish saxophonist called Tommy Smith, and once I I phoned him up, I don't know how I got his number. Uh, I must have been quite young, fourteen, fifteen, and then he picked up, and I was like, oh, I couldn't believe he picked up, and I said, oh, I've been listening to your album, and uh, there's this standard and it was a rhythm changes now i can't remember the name of it it goes i can't remember the name of the tune one of your listeners will be like oh that's um yeah anyway, suck with names. Said, <laughs> so he just read it out to me over the phone he's like okay so you got g g sharp a f D, and I started writing it down. And then at the end, I was like, do, 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 be, do, 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 do. and I was like, this is great. <laughs> and it was like <laughs> real person YouTuber, as, as good as we got back then. Um, when would that have been? I guess, what, late 80s, early 90s or something? So, yeah, I think it's a fantastic resource. And, you know, obviously not just for music. If I want to solve any problem, I'm just on YouTube straight away. Find the answer instantly. It's amazing. But you're right. Sometimes there's it's just a, a, a load of bite-sized, disconnected pieces of often conflicting information, isn't it? Yeah, which yeah. I, I do I do feel for the for the uh, saxophonists, saxophonists who are trying to learn from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it it is challenging. I mean, it's like you, I do wish that there was something like YouTube around because. Um, you know, if you have a simple question about something, you could look it up. But yeah, then then you, you do have different opinions. And in some ways, that is good, because I know for me, certain teachers registered with me more than others. And it's not like the other teacher was bad. It's just that, you know, their teaching style just it just didn't resonate. That's all, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or this other person said it a different way. It's like, oh, or, you know, I finally heard, you know, I've heard this thing said a million times. And then I heard it the 15th time, like, Oh, now I get it. You know, um, I yeah. mean, there's, 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 there's those kind of situations. I, I do wish I had YouTube um, growing up, but, but it's, I, I just feel um, if you're, if you're learning an instrument, not even jazz, if you're learning how to play an instrument, I really strongly feel that you need to see a teacher. You need to get that one-on-one. -on -one, you know, there's no substitute, is there? No. I mean. Kind of like I should be the advocate for the opposite because you know a lot of my business is now the opposite. But me too. That is yeah. The truth. Yeah. That is yeah. the truth. And um, I make no apologies for it. I make online courses because I'm trying my very best to help the maximum number of people enjoy music and improve their playing. And if people can just improve, you know, a bit and have more fun and bring a bit more happiness to their lives and everyone else's lives, I'm like, yes. Yes. Brilliant. But of course, if they came here and saw me for the equivalent number of hours, they'd probably make more progress. There's, there's no avoiding that. But I figure it's better to do it. Let's call it imperfect action, right? And it's 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 not only that too, though. It, you know, it, people are different types styles of learners as well. I think that there's benefits to both. Um, when I see people one on one. You know, we'll go through a lot of different things, but then I don't know if this happens for you too. A lot of times, um, you know, uh, oh, this thing, particular thing happened, and I have to prepare for this this concert this week. So you get sidetracked off of any kind of you know 
like I don't have a set curriculum, so to speak. I do have my my processes, my my um, my uh, systems and stuff like that. But you know, there's times it, life happens, especially for adults. Life happens, or you get involved, you know, with an opportunity to play in a band. You've got an audition, or this, or that, or whatever. And when you're studying one on one, it can take longer to actually learn the stuff that you can learn online. You know, where it's in a course. And the cool thing is you're watching videos, you could rewind it, right? Because, right, yeah. you know, you, you can't, Vince always said this to me too. Um, he would, he would uh, record all of our lessons on cassette tape. I still have the cassette tapes. And I'd be listening to it as I'm driving to, you know, to college, you know, in that horrific New York traffic. And so all that stuff is burned in my brain from the recordings. So there's, right. I think there's benefits to both for sure. But, um, you know, I think when it comes to very beginners learning how to produce sound and stuff like that, I mean, I can do it. I've done it online with success, but I do think for a lot of people, I think the one-to-one -one interaction, at least for like a month, just to, you know, get things going, I think is the best solution. That's my uh, humble opinion. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And, you know, most people can, can find a sax teacher somewhere. I mean, I've got plenty of people who have e emailed me from weird and wonderful places or they haven't got access to, to a teacher, but um yeah completely agree there's no because that you get the you know whereas it might take you a week to kind of discover something and correct it it can be done in seconds so you can almost make weeks worth of progress in in seconds in fact i had somebody one of those students i was just describing to you who i, I taught online and then they came here and she was just gobsmacked after the first lesson she's like oh wow why does nobody ever say that why does nobody ever you know tell you it's going to be like this or you blow that loud or you need so little pressure or you know i'm doing all these things wrong and it's a good question but <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, you know what it is it's because it's sometimes it's also personalized too you know as as well but you know you know uh, speaking of like personalized and stuff like that um i want to go back to when you were talking about sound you know and producing sound um and people are, are going to want to know actually about your equipment because the, yeah, yeah. the thing is there's, I, I definitely want you to get into your equipment, but I also want to say this too. Um, and I'm sure that you've, you've dealt with this as well. You probably had a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, I just need to get, you know, that person's equipment and that's going to improve my sound automatically. Or, you know, it's, it's, and, and don't get me wrong. I've had many manufacturers, you know, um, on the show for sure. And, and of course I buy equipment as well, but I think it's the, you know, the, the thought, the mistaken belief that people have that, you know, oh, if I just get um, a larger tip opening mouthpiece or this person's mouthpiece, that's going to solve all my problems. I know I fell down that trap many years ago, and I even had a teacher that, you know, guided me down that trap. Like, oh, yeah, we got to get the biggest tip opening and the hardest read and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, all right. My teacher said this, I'll do this. But um can we talk about those two things, you know, like whether you agree or not, you know, that that belief of the equipment will solve everything and also what what equipment do you play on? Sure. Yeah, great. Yeah, I love this. I love this topic. So it's obviously impossible, isn't it, to put a a percentage on these, um, you know, personal and subjective values. But let's just say for the sake of argument that it's maybe 75 or 80 percent is you and then 20 percent is the equipment and I'd, I'd say that's a reasonable shout because the the litmus test is if i come and play your horn how much do i sound like me and how much do i sound like you right and vice versa so maybe you could maybe you know <laughs> if we weren't all completely paranoid about uh, transmitting viruses we, we could set an experiment up um now, I don't know if it's fair to do it with pros or amateurs. Maybe you could do both. But the experiment would be this. There's your normal, there's your setup and there's their setup. You both play your own instrument and then you swap and you play the, the same thing. And maybe you do that with pros and maybe you do that with amateurs. And then you kind of measure, well, how much does he still sound like himself on that equipment? And I would guess it's 75 to 80%. You're still going to sound yourself. However, everyone is spending 80% more, 90% of their time talking about that 20% instead of the 80%.
In fact, that's why I made my course, Total Tone Mastery, to address this. I'm like, yeah, mouthpieces, I'm not going to say mouthpieces don't make a difference. Saxes don't make a difference. You know, ligatures don't, don't make a difference. Reeds, of course, you know, make a difference. But when you think about it in terms of the math, we say maths, but I'm saying math to make you feel at home. <laughs> when you think about it in terms of the maths, um, let's say your mouthpiece makes, help me out here, let, let's say 25% of difference, you know, to your sound. Well, that's 25%, that's a quarter of the 20, right? So, you know, now you're down to five of the overall sound. So, and then you look at your horn, and then the horn is even further away, because we all know that the most important thing for your sound is everything inside your body. And then you get to the mouthpiece and reed, which is the next most important thing, and then you get to the neck, which is the next most important thing, and then the sax, which is the least important. All things being equal, like, let's assume there's no leaks and blah, blah, blah. For, you know, equipment fail is massive if, you're, if, you're, if your sax is in good shape. So... You know, maybe your sax makes 10% difference, and then you're like a tenth, so now we're like 2% of, you know, whatever it is <laughs> in the overall thing. But <clears throat> it's much easier to talk about the mouthpiece and the reed than it is to try and explain the anatomy of your larynx. Or to try, because we're double blind, we're, this is the big problem with teaching saxophone, we're double blind. I can't see inside my mouth you can't see inside my mouth, I can't see inside your mouth, and you can't see inside your mouth either. So I'm trying to describe something that I think is happening in my mouth. You can't see if that's true or not, neither can I. And then I tell you, and then there's the whole thing of interpreting it, and then you try and recreate what I'm saying I think is happening inside my mouth. Oh my God, I mean, talk about margin for error or what. In fact, that book um, that we're going to link in the show notes, he's got these fluoroscopy, which is like a sort of live x-ray. Yeah. Yeah. So you can actually see 100% what's happening. Yeah, they the do this time. with brass That's players. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's been studies about this with brass players uh, that were out many, many years ago. I, I remember this, and I, I couldn't remember the word fluoroscopy. That's exactly yeah. it. Where they were showing how people articulated and, right. you know, tongue position in the mouth. I'm so glad you, you said that. Right, and it's amazing when you see what happens inside your larynx and your, and it's all doing nothing like anybody just thought they were doing, you know. Anyway, so the, the thing that we should all be focusing on is the bit we can, you know, make the most improvement. So if you could make, you know, 50% improvement in your part, you're going to massively improve your sound. If you're trying to look for marginal gains with your mouthpiece and reed and saxophone... You might get some marginal gains, but you're still missing out the massive part of the equation, which you can, you know, really need to work on. So that's my thoughts on the matter. And we all know, we've all seen the YouTube videos. I've done it myself. Hey, see if you can spot the Yamaha 4C compared to my, you know, $700 Florida Link, whatever. And, you know, there's not that much difference. And that's why. Because if I played your horn right now, it'd sound like me. And if you played mine, you'd sound like you. Yeah. And if the uh, super keen amateur who's, you know, saving up to buy one of Theo's mouthpieces, <laughs> they might end up being disappointed when I play their setup and sound almost as good as me. So, which brings me on to my setup, which I'm more than happy to share, which is uh, on tenor, I play a Mark VI, Selma Mark VI. It's a really late Mark VI. And hang on. Yeah, for some reason, there's this thing. Don't give everybody your full serial number. Why? <laughs> Somebody explain why. It's it's your social security number. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just, there, there might be some really big reason why you're not allowed to give the um, serial number of your sax. So I'm too scared. So I'm only going to say it's 227,000. Okay, got it. Yeah, so probably like 1971 or Maybe even two. Maybe it's the, the, yeah, the very it's end one of the them. last ones they ever made, basically. Yeah. And they'd already released the Mark Seven when that was made, so it was oh, one of the last. Okay. Yeah, I think it's one of the last, you know, five ten thousand Mark Sixes or something. I can't remember exactly. Um, 
I don't think it's the greatest Mark VI ever. I've played other Mark VI's. I much prefer, truth be told. <laughs> so I've got a kind of Mark VI envy, even within Mark VI's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I've been playing it my whole life, so I know it inside out. Um, which is one of the most important things about this entire discussion. It's almost better to know what you've got than to try different things that you don't really know. I can tell you exactly how many cents every single note on that horn is going to be sharp or flat, or which note is going to you know, not speak, which note is going to, you know, I know every single corner of it. So that's my horn. I've got a Florida Link uh, mouthpiece. Um, I'm sure the sort of geeks amongst you will know what that means. It was before they moved the factory from Florida, the Auto Link factory. And it's one of the sort of desirable classic mouthpieces, which I didn't know at the time. I just swapped it for, um, there was a friend of mine who had, no, I had one of, um, now what's it, who's that mouthpiece maker, ex-Russian emigre dude, he lived in the UK, I think he died, um, Greg, Freddie Gregory, I went, um, when I was hanging out with Lieben, we took him to Fred, Freddie Gregory's, and Fred, and he was playing at um, the uh, Pizza Express Jazz Club in London, Lieb was, and so we went off at this day trip, saw Freddie Gregory, hung out there and then Freddie stayed up all night and made leave this new mouthpiece um and while I was there I bought one of his ebonite mouthpieces which was awesome and then years down the line I swapped that for this metal link which I didn't know it was a Florida link I didn't know anything about it it was just like a bit of you know I just tried it and I liked it um turns out it's a classic <laughs> and that's an eight looks like it might have had a little bit of work done to it but those Florida links they've got a nice little kind of little bit of a rollover baffle, not much to speak of, but it does give it a nice little bit of bite. And I find I can play absolutely anything on it. I can play a pop gig. I can play jazz, you know, I can play a background gig. I can play something rock and roll. Um, people who watch my channel know I kind of play things in lots of different genres and I use the same mouthpiece for all of it. Now that's not to say that if I got myself a nice tasty Gardala with a doorstep baffle i wouldn't you know sound more rock and roll in fact i've been <laughs> thinking about getting dark side getting another mouthpiece but that's what i've got and then the reeds i use are uh van Doren java red box usually three and a half so i guess it's you know that's quite a big setup in many ways three and a half reeds eight eight tip opening um on alto i've got a mark six as well and I've also forgotten the serial number. Hang on. It is 124,000. So not not a coveted five-digit Mark VI. So <laughs> I've got a more Mark VI envy. <laughs> and then I've got um, I've got one of Jody's mouthpieces. I've got just an HR. Uh, eight uh, mouthpiece. I tried when I was when I was changing my alto mouthpiece. I tried lots of different mouthpieces, but for me, it's it's a struggle to find some because I'm a tenor player. I'm used to just tanking it. When I go to alto, I, f I struggled to find something that wasn't closing up and was stuffing up on me. So the jo the Jody was nice and open, and I could blow straight through it without any back pressure. So that's what I got. And same reads, Java. Uh, red box three and a half and I, you know I do tinker with my read geek and get them working get the get the rails balanced um, I've done a couple of videos recently on Leger reads I've been experimenting with them um, I prefer them on soprano and baritone funnily enough it's jury's out on the other two for me right now I have done quite hard gigs with them and they kind of split a bit but I'm just so tempted by the convenience Oh. oh yeah, I use Legere, and um, yeah. for the types of situations that I've been in, where you know uh, you've got to you've warmed up, then you've got to wait a long time before you play, and then you don't have time to stick a read on. You just have to go, you know. Yeah. Or it's very dry here in Los Angeles, and you don't want to squeak, you know, like crazy. So yeah, it's it's convenient, and um, yeah. And, and, you know, even uh, I've used Legere's for a very long time. And, and in the middle of that, I was using Rigotti Golds and stuff like that. Um, and I still have some Rigotti Golds, you know, here as well. But um, I know a lot of my friends use Fiber Reed. 
They're great reads as well, too, you know, but yeah, the convenience. What, are you talking about a fiber cell? No, actually fiber read, Harry Hartman's fiber read. Um, oh yeah, those ones, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, they've expanded their line of, of you know, uh, different styles of reads and stuff for sure. I mean, there's so many options right now. I know, I, I, I should experiment, but I've just never really been much of a tinkerer, if you know what I mean. Yeah, myself too. I, I hate going down rabbit holes because it's like, you know, after a while, it's like everything, it, it everything gets, uh, you know, you f try something and it's like, oh, that's not bad. Then you try another thing. Oh, that may be better. And then after a while, you're trying so many things. It's like, oh my God, it's overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going back to my earlier point, I think there is power. Uh, you can definitely find a better setup for you, especially as you're like beginner, intermediate, da, da, da. But there's definitely power in knowing what you've got inside out especially in a pro prototype setting. So uh, we, we mentioned intonation, didn't we, tuning earlier, and knowing which notes, I mean, whenever you play a middle E, it's probably gonna be sharp in any sax, but just knowing how sharp and which other notes might be off, and, and even having, you know, I've got lots of custom fingerings just to make things go in tune a bit better. You can put down your low B key when you play a middle E and all that stuff to flatten it. Um, so especially on the Mark really sixes too, especially on the Mark sixes too, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right, the D's, the E's, they tend to run uh, pretty sharp, um, especially compared to modern horns, for sure. Yeah, and I would like to, you know, having just said all that big speech about, you know, I don't tinker and know what you got, it's mostly because I couldn't afford to get anything to try, <laughs> to be honest. But now I've got my channel, you know, you do get approached a bit more, and actually, I'm, I'm definitely going to start getting around sax shops a bit more and try out. I'd love to try out a Supreme. Have you played a Supreme? No. New Salmon Supreme? No, no, I haven't. No, oh. me neither. I'd love to try one, especially when they bring out the tenor. But I think they're like sold out for five years or something, aren't they? I don't know. I'm not sure, but you, you've got sax.co.uk yeah, no, by yeah. you, right? So That's do brilliant. they have them there? <laughs> yeah, but they're not, not. I'm sure they do, but they're probably um, already earmarked to be sold. Ah. Uh. Unless they just have a display one in there. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to check it out. Yeah. I mean, that's like a can I've never been, but I've had students go and it's like a candy store. <laughs> yeah, I better, yeah. I better start selling some serious courses before I buy a cell supreme, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get that one past quality control with my wife. Wow. <laughs> How much? <laughs> do we have to remortgage the house? <laughs> Well, do you know how much cellists spend? This is nothing. <laughs> there you go. That's 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 perfect speak. <laughs> you can compare it. <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, but you know, it's 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 so true. Um, and I know this that, you know, you are your sound. You know, you you said this before, you are your sound, and it's it's you that you have to develop, you know, because um as you know, for myself, I know this, but also all the people I've interviewed for the podcast, the main theme has been that the equipment, you want to get equipment that gets out of your way. When your equipment gets in your way, that's when you start to think, okay, first thing, read. Let me just see, do I need to try a different read? Okay, no, it's not the read. Mouthpiece. Is it the mouthpiece? You know, you go through that. Then you go through, you know, maybe trying different horns and stuff, but you are the one that makes your sound. And and as again, as Vince used to say to me too, if there's nothing, if you're not hearing anything in your head, if you're not, not hearing any kind of tonal concept in your head, how could you possibly expect a great sound to come out of the horn, you know, if you're not feeding your brain good information, you know, so it's, it's all that combined for sure. Right. That expectation's huge, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I think I've, I've got it in my in my course, the old expression, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So if you if you don't really have a concept of what sound you're about to make, well, it's a bit of a lottery, isn't it? And it might not <laughs> it might not be a result that you necessarily like. But for me, every time I take a breath and, and I pick up any sax, I have a super clear expectation of what is going to come out. And if it doesn't, it won't be long before I make the adjustments for that to happen. It's crazy. Right. Which is why I've spent, you know, months at a time sometimes with a leaky horn and it's I've kind of managed to work around it. I don't know how. Maybe like just correcting for an overtone or which is just crazy. Like get your horn serviced, dude. But um
Get your horn together. Ex- <laughs> get your horn together. It's that expectation. I expect that note to come out, and damn, it will. And if it doesn't, it won't be more than three or four tries before I realize why it's not, and then it will. Got it. And and listen, you know, as as you know, as pros, when we perform, you know, things break, and you you got to make it yeah. work. You know, you 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 don't have the luxury sometimes of get, getting the horn repaired or or even having the time too. You know, because too many shows are together. So you know, what's interesting to me. What I had wanted to ask before. Um, I do have a Mark VI. I've got a Trevor James also. Awesome, awesome horns. And I have what I call my beach horn, my my backup horn that I use for outside gigs. I used to use it on gigs going, you know, playing at the Hamptons and stuff uh, in the Hamptons in Long Island when I'm outside by the sand and stuff. Um, it's a Joe Sachs Cirrus brand. It's actually a great horn. But you don't have any backup horns for your, your horns? Oh, yeah, I, I do actually. I've got a tenor. Um, uh, what is it? YTS 23? Is that the tenor one? Oh, that's the, the alto. One. Uh, uh, well, YTS twenty three, yeah, and then Y Y A Y A S twenty three was the alto yeah. one, yeah. So I've actually got two. I've got two Yamaha twenty threes, one on tenor, one on alto, which are my kind of spares. Yep. Is that it? Uh, yeah. I think I've only got two of each. <laughs> yeah, and I've only got one soprano, one baritone, and you know, woodwinds, bass, clarinet, clarinet, piccolo, flute, alto, flute. But um, yeah, not very many horns, eh? No, no, no. Well, you know, here's the thing too, though. Um, I mean, you got you've got a lot of horns in total, but um, I know for me, um, especially if one horn is not working, I know I need a backup. So, yeah, yeah. you know, backups are the main horns, absolutely. And to have a backup, Barry, that's a little pricey. So that's, yeah, that's, that's hard to do. <laughs> you know, if you're listening, Yanagisawa, I'm quite open. You know, to uh, <laughs> try and get your stuff. <laughs> Giving a great review. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, so. Well, listen, listen, I wanted to thank you so much for your time. I know we covered a whole whole bunch of things here. There's there's other things I wanted to cover, but that's all cool. But um, you don't listen quick fire. This isn't quick fire. I'll oh, all right. Instantly. OK. Oh, God. All right. I, I didn't prepare myself for this, but yeah, let me let me do a couple of ones that I've asked in the past. Um, okay. If there was a tool that was, let's say, under $100, right? Um, yeah. You know, whatever, whatever it may be for you, but a tool that's under $100 that you couldn't live without. Do you have something like that? Um, yeah. Combined, uh, uh, combined Korg TM40 tuner and metronome. Old school. Definitely old school. No tonal energy. <laughs> No smiley faces. Uh, see, I was <laughs> no going to say rewards. total energy. <laughs> <laughs> no dopamine hits every day. No gamification, guys. Just... Doop, doop, doop. Yeah. Next. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, I'm not... Uh, well, no, let me say this. Is there... Aside from being younger, I asked this question before, but um, if you had like one piece of advice and i i'm gonna think in my head that you probably gave this already but if you had one piece of advice to you know the listeners out here with regard let's say to improvisation not to tone okay Okay. let's say improvisation what would one piece of advice that you would give to people who are you know aspiring improvisers who you know i'm not saying the professionals at this point i'm saying people that you know started out improvising you know doing a bit of work in it do you have any kind of like one one tip for them? Yes. Transcribe as many solos as you can and p- practice until you can play along with them like a perfect shadow with no difference between you and the record. That's awesome, man. That's that's concise and down to the point. That's no, that's really good. That's really good. That's, I reckon that's one of the most for the kind of level that you're talking about. That's one of the most transformative things that anyone could possibly do. What if, and, what if, uh, and transcribe people who are like OG fantastic don't transcribe the latest you know um instagram sensation transcribe who they you know even like if you want to play like candy dolfer she's absolutely brilliant don't transcribe candy go and transcribe macy or you know go to the source and what would you say though to to someone who be like oh but i can't learn anything by ear you know i I just i can't do it i can't do it what would you i'm sure you've had students like that or or maybe not i I don't know i recommend rick beato's ear training course if you just Google Rick Beato ear training course, um, we can probably put a link in the show notes. It's easily found. He's, he's usually got some kind of discount going on. That's fantastic. 
you just start off with the easiest thing you can imagine then intervals chords you know blah that'll really train your ear you can train your ears it's not like it's a you know it's a muscle like anything else you can you can learn ear training that's great and actually you know what that's that's another tool that's probably under a hundred dollars i would think yes yeah, so i would say it's around about the hundred dollars mark yeah yeah that's perfect that's perfect um who is who is your and, and i this can be interpreted two ways but who was your greatest mentor the person that inspired you the most uh that's a good one i guess i would have to say richard michael because in my formative years he was the reason that i ended up playing jazz for sure i've had lots of mentors but yeah probably the most significant one okay cool because you know what's interesting when i've asked this question in the past people have said the masters that they've transcribed so let me ask this question then you know of all the people that you know you've listened to um and transcribed or or even not transcribed or whatever but who is like you know and it's hard to pick one i totally get it but like one person that you know you love you know that is your favorite player my number one favorite player sonny coltrane <laughs> can i can i cheat by saying sonny coltrane <laughs> Wait, 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 who's that? Okay, just, I get you. Just pretend that it's one person. Because <laughs> I can't choose between Rollins and Trains, so I'm going to say Sonny Coltrane. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's really brilliant. I love it. <laughs> For sure. Um, oh, my gosh. I, I, I suck at these 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 rapid-fire questions. I really do, but I think... <laughs> Really do, but 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 let me ask you this though: Are okay. there any upcoming projects that you have, whether it's performing, you know, whether it's teaching, anything coming up for us to know? Well, I'm considering having a go at making a complete beginners saxophone program because I think we're in the kind of we're at the 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 leading edge of the next saxophone craze, right? You know, there was a massive saxophone craze in the 20s or whatever. And I think it's happening again. It seems to be exploding in popularity. And I'd like to be there to try and serve these people who have just picked it up. Maybe they just, you know, bought, a, you know, John Paul off Amazon or whatever. And, um, and they want to just get up and running and get started. Now, there's lots of people who have who can do that. Um, Jay's got some videos. I'm sure you have. Um, but I want to I want to get on. I want to get on that on that train and just offer my perspective to people how to really get going from zero not to hero but um you know <laughs> zero to what do we how do we call it <laughs> words escape me yeah yeah no that that's going to be a tricky one for sure and um yeah yeah and i've got some you know i've got some uh courses and videos and stuff like that too i'm sure jay does as well but the interesting thing you said was perspective you know yeah. and we alluded to this before too where we all have different experiences for sure that we can definitely uh, relay to people. I think that's going to be awesome. I think it's definitely going to be awesome. I think you should do uh, it. Yeah. And the, the, the beautiful thing is um, some people like to learn from Scott Paddock. Some people like to learn from you. Some people like to learn from Better Sax. Some people, for some reason, like to learn from me. And um, we can all contribute and everyone can. And actually, there's a whole bunch of people that like to learn from loads of different people, which is cool. Right. So, um, I think as kind of sax educators, that's that's the beautiful, rewarding part of the job that people can go from nothing and then start to really enjoy it and then see the excitement when they can play the song they've always wanted to be able to play and, you know, maybe join a band, get a new social life, um, keep their brain active if they've retired. Um, all these fantastic benefits of playing an instrument. You know, when you, when you see sort of brain imagery of people playing music it just every area of your brain lights up like a christmas tree when you play music so the more people we can encourage to do so the better i say so yeah for sure look. and it's also going to bring more people to you know to shows to live shows because they're going right. to appreciate it more yeah, you know yeah, and that's true, yeah. you know and that it's just it's it's great 
all the way around. Uh, absolutely. Well, listen, Jamie, this was so much fun. This was so awesome. I, I'm glad we had the chance to do this. And, um, you know, everybody, I'm sure, <laughs> is laughing along with us with all the jokes and stuff like that. And I appreciate you and, and, you know, the time that you gave us, but also everything that you do as well. I love watching your videos. I learn things from watching you. Uh, I just wanted to say that I really do. And, um, you know, thank you again for being a guest here. Thanks so much. I listen to Sax podcasts all the time as well. So I hope I haven't been too boring for the people that normally listen to Sax podcasts. No, 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 no. This was fun. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. I am sure people were laughing along with us. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's the anyway, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a real, real pleasure. I've really enjoyed myself.